In a previous video, I was doing a black box log analysis of a two blade versus three blade props. And when I got to the two blade props, I saw that the D term at full throttle was really, was pretty pretty over the line. I'm willing to accept a certain amount of, of, of noise or, or dirtiness in the, in the traces in order to get per good performance, but, but this was too much. And so I thought I would do a video about how I tried to approach cleaning that up. And in the process, I think I did something pretty cool. This is, I think, one of my better videos on tuning. So if you're into black box and you're into tuning, stick around for this one. I think you're going to like it a lot. You can see in this screenshot from the previous video that even when I'm not 100% at full throttle, there are conditions where the D-term has gotten way, way too noisy. Now, I'm not at full throttle here. I'm actually just finishing a full throttle run, and I've started to reduce the throttle and pitch back. So the copter is experiencing a lot of onrushing wind as I pitch back. I'm moving, I'm going from 70 miles an hour, literally 70 miles an hour, to pitching back and climbing up. So although this is not traditionally what we would think of as a prop wash situation, I'm not turning sharply or falling into my own prop wash. There is a lot of onrushing wind that is buffeting the props, and it's making the D-term get pretty bad. And the P-term looks pretty bad here too. And there's a very important thing when you're tuning, and that is that you can't tell if the P-term is having a problem when the D-term is having a problem. The D-term makes such a mess out of everything that you can't tell whether your P-term is right or wrong. So if you see a situation like this, in my opinion, the only approach is to get the D-term under control because otherwise you won't be able to tell whether your P-term is right or wrong. Now, there are times when you can see very, very clear P-term oscillations. So if we look at this example, which is from the same flight, uh, this example is actually from the 5040 Tri-Blade props. This is not the King Kong 5040s I normally fly. Regardless, if we look at this example, we can see the P-term line has a very def definite, smooth, sinusoidal shape with very regular frequency. Look at the spaces between the peaks. The peaks themselves, or the, the, the P-term line them itself, is very smooth. It doesn't have a lot of jaggies in it. The jagged line is indicative of the D-term dominating. Here we can see the P-term is very smooth. So this is a case where the P term is dominating, and this is a clear case of excess P gain. Now we may also have excess D gain in this scenario, but in this case, the P term is the one that is clearly driving the bad behavior. Whereas if we look back at the previous example, here the D term is clearly dominant, and the reason we say that is because there is a lot of this high frequency, jagged, narrow, irregular, different, sh rapidly changing magnitude, uh, frequency is all over the place, right? That's the D-term dominating. The reason it works that way is that the D-term is, is amplifying noise in the system. And since the noise in the system is fairly random, the D-term is fairly random as well. When the D-term is below this threshold where it flips out, it sort of follows the P-term nicely Kind of, like a, kind of like a dog at the end of a leash, right? They're just walking along, nicely healed at the end of the leash. And then there's this point where the noise is too much for the D-term, and it flips out, okay? And then instead of it sort of walking gently along behind the P-term, helping out, now it's just making the whole thing crazy, dropping the groceries on the floor, you know, etc. okay? Whereas excess P-gain has this sinusoidal, consistent magnitude and consistent uh, frequency, and the reason for that is that P-term oscillations that come from excess P-gain are a function of the mechanical and physical characteristics of the system. So it's similar to how if you take a pendulum and you drop the pendulum, right, the pendulum will swing with a consistent frequency. And that's because the, the length of the pendulum arm and the acceleration of gravity all combine to make that be the case. We have the same thing when we think about a copter. The motors are a certain distance from the CG. The motors have a certain ability to respond to inputs so fast they produce so much force. And all of that together means that when the, the PID controller gets into a P-term oscillation, it's going to tend to have a very consistent uh, frequency, magnitude, and it's going to kind of look like this. So that's how you can start to tell when you've got this kind of a situation, whether you've got D-term or P-term issues. In one case, you clearly have excess P gain. In another case, you may have excess D gain. 
But the thing to keep in mind again is that if the D term is flipping out, you may also have P term problems and not know it. And you can't tell if the D term is, if the P term is flipping out or having an issue until you tame the D term and then you can find out. All right, so I went back and I looked at this file and I tried to think about what I wanted to do. We can see here that the D term is, the magnitude of the D term is roughly proportional to the P term. It's not that the D term is bigger than the P term. It's just that the D term is having a lot of crazy issues where it's, where it's getting out of control. So it made me wonder whether the right thing to do was not to change my D gains at all, but to add some filtering to the D term so that the high frequency noise that gets in when the throttle is high, when the copter is undergoing extreme prop wash, get, get filtered out. But how do you know what the cutoff frequency should be for that filter? How aggressively do we need to filter? Now you can try to do that with trial and error, but I, you know, I like to do things systematically and I'm gonna show you how to figure that out systematically what the cutoff filter of your D-term filter should be. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna run this black box log through black box decode by just dragging and dropping on top of it. Black box decode will run and will create a CSV file in the same folder that will have a spreadsheet containing the black box information. The next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna run a Fourier analysis on this using the New Hertz Spectra program. I've showed you that once before on this channel, but I'm just gonna show you again in case anybody missed it. In order to do that, we need to know the sample rate. And in order to do that, the simplest thing to do is just to subtract the loop time, the loop iteration time from each other in the spreadsheet. You could figure out what your sample rate must probably be by thinking about your loop time, but then you've got the black box rate denominator, and then there's additional denominators that come into play in some versions of Betaflight. And the simplest thing to do is just to subtract the loop time from each other, and you'll see what it is. So in this case, my loop time, for black box anyway, my black box loop time is 1500 microseconds, which I can then convert to a Hertz by just taking one over that number. And so you can see here, 1500 microsecond loop time equates to 666 Hertz. Great. Next, we're gonna take the axis D column and we're gonna copy it to a text file. Notice that there are three axis D columns Axis D zero is roll, one is pitch, and two is yaw. We can only do this on one axis at a time. So I'm gonna copy the axis D zero column, and then I'm gonna copy it into, or paste it into a text file. And I'm gonna save that text file. By the way, I gotta take off that top line. The text file should only contain the numbers, and I'm just gonna say, name it whatever, data.dat. Okay, done. And then I start up the New Hertz Spectra program, and you can download this program for free off the internet. It's, you'll see the name of it in one second. It's New Hertz Spectra. We open the data file. We enter the sample rate, which we previously determined to be 666 Hertz. And then in a second, it will bring up the Fourier analysis that we're looking for. Great. Now there's a couple extra windows here. Some There's the phase window, which I don't care about. Here's the frequency data, which I do care about. And I'm gonna go ahead and turn off the phase component because I only care about the magnitude, not the phase. So what is this showing us? We've got frequency on the x-axis, that's the horizontal axis, and we've got magnitude on the y-axis, that's the vertical axis. So the higher up the yellow line is at a given frequency, the more energy there is at that frequency, okay? And we can see that this D term has a lot of energy up to somewhere between about 100 and 200 hertz. And we can ask ourselves, where would I have to put my low pass cutoff in order to significantly reduce this? Now, bear in mind that the, the, the spikes or the high energy components down at lower frequencies, we don't wanna filter those. Those are the actual P-term movements that the D-term is trying to keep up with. So we're trying to remove the high frequency jitters while leaving behind the useful components uh, that where the, the D term is moving in sync with the P term and doing its job well. I know that I don't wanna filter too aggressively because it will cause phase delay. The lower you filter, the more phase delay you get. And then we know that flight characteristics get worse when the D term is 
out of phase with the P term. We want to minimize the phase delay between the D term and the P term. And that's why the default setting for beta flight is to not have any D term filtering at all. We accept a, a, an increase in the amount of noise in exchange for a, a decrease in the amount of phase delay between the P term and the D term. In fact, there's basically no phase delay by default, and that's, that's desirable. But in this case, I can see if I want to you know, get rid of some of this high frequency noise, I could filter around somewhere between maybe 40 and 60 hertz, and that would chop and, and attenuate the, the noise at the higher frequency while leaving behind the lower frequency stuff. I, I get, would have to play around with it. There's still going to be some trial and error to try and get it exactly right, but I can see that there's, there's no point in having it be, say, above... 80 or 100 hertz because the, the, the noise is already significantly rolled off at that point, right? So I, I need to get down below about 60 or 50 hertz to really start attenuating the noise that's in here. Now that was the roll axis. Here's the pitch axis. And we can see immediately that the pitch axis is much less noisy than the roll axis. And that's because of the weight distribution of the copter. It is more spread out along the pitch axis and so it is more inherently damped. There's basically built-in physical low-pass filtering on the pitch axis. So I don't think we really need to think much about the filtering from the perspective of the, of the pitch axis. However, the pitch axis does show us that there is a very, very strong peak around, let's say, 40 hertz. And that probably is actual like gyro data that we want to be operating on and not noise. So that's good to remember that that peak is around 40 hertz. And then here is the yaw axis. And the yaw axis is very, very clean. And the reason for that is that the deep gain on the yaw axis is much, much lower. I believe the gains here are roll 7, pitch 9, yaw 3. So there's just not a lot going on on the yaw axis. We don't need to think too hard about that. Based on all this, I decided to set my D-term LPF hertz to a value of 40. The peak for where the actual gyro data is is around 40. But my hope was that this would give strong attenuation above that, and it'll only be 3 dB down uh, at the cutoff frequency, so it wouldn't unnecessarily attenuate the frequencies that we really cared about the most. I save the results, and then we go out and fly, and we'll see what happens.